So this is Jack Spillane, um, the editorial page editor at the Standard Times, and I'm here with the editorial board and members of the South Coast Legislative Delegation, and we're here to talk about uh, the funding formula for uh, education in Massachusetts, which uh, they're going to take another crack at reforming this year. So as we usually start, people are free to make statements and, and open it up, and then we'll ask questions as, as we go along. So welcome, all. Uh, introductions. Uh, so. I'm Beth Perdue, editor of the Standard Times. And Carol Paiola, uh, representing a part of Fall River and Freetown. Tony Cabral, representing the best. Norman Hall, representing Berkeley, Lakeville, Artifon, and Park Middlebar. Uh, Paul Schmidt, 8th Bristol District, uh, representing Westport and parts of uh, Fall River, Freetown, and New Bedford. Chris Hendricks, 11th Bristol District, which includes the majority of the North End of New Bedford and a cushion. Oh, you're looking for me, I guess. Uh, well, let me put it this way. I, I'm excited we're going to be able to address this this legislative session. I believe we are going to do that. The last time we, we attempted to do it, the House had a different version than the Senate. We only attempted to do two out of the four recommendations. We had originally done a commission, which never met because it never passed, uh, to look at the other two recommendations and come back with a better sense of the cost of those recommendations. Maybe it's good to just say to everybody what those recommendations are. There's special ed, English language learning, the cost of health care, right. and poverty. And and yes, yes. Uh, we had just done the uh, both the health care cost and, and special ed on the House. The Senate done all four recommendations the last time around. A bill has been, is being filed, uh, which I am a co-sponsor of that bill on the House side, uh, to look at all four recommendations. Uh, I think I, we, I, we spoke earlier at a, a late last year on this issue uh, uh, with you, I spoke with you on this issue. Um, I think it seems that the cost, if, uh, if all, all four recommendations are to be adopted, the cost would be about a billion dollars, uh, a little shy of that, maybe just around there. Uh, depends who you listen to, uh, which numbers you look at. Mm -hmm. um, phased in, obviously. Uh, the one that we passed on the House side was just two recommendations, it was $500 million a five-year uh, phase in of those. Um, you know, I, I really, and I supported that because I really thought, I really believed uh, that we were going to be back with recommendations from the commission to address the other two. The other two are very important for us in New Bedford, uh, as it is in most gateway cities, uh, which is English language learners and obviously low-income students. Uh, those uh, New Bedford would benefit significantly if all four recommendations were to be adopted, potentially you would see possibly anything from 30 million to possibly 39 million more uh, in, on, over, the course of, over the course of the phase in uh, for, for chapter 70 for the city of Bradford. So I think that's significant. I mean, we some people say that money is not everything, but we think we believe that resources are very important in this particular situation. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, but I was trying to um, at the Legislative Academy, I can tell you that was one of the topics we were all discussing. We had free time. We were talking about this issue, where it landed in the last session. And, and I think everyone thought it was so close that they, they really were hoping it would go through. Um, with the governor and his statements, I think he is very much obviously making it a four point. So I think the energy is there. I felt it as, as being someone new into the House, as being uh, one of the top topics, um, the other one being transportation maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, so, you know, one of the other differences, as I understand, between the House and Senate version in the last session was the accountability that the House put in. <coughs> and I do think that is important to keep it a, a method of, uh, you know, just holding school districts accountable. Um, three of us represent a regional district, Freetown Lakeville here, my old instrument and myself. And, uh, with regional districts, I think it gets even a little more complicated because um, they really act as a separate municipality almost with their budgets. So it's tough for the towns to, to, to get information for accountability. So I think it's important that the state sets up some portion. Of that. Is it tough for the suburb? I think I, what, what's good about this and why you saw a unanimous vote in the House for, for the version last time was I think everybody understands this is let's just set everything else aside and address the real cost of educating. And the House version, of course, dealt with the healthcare side, um, which is a number that we can put our hands on. Uh, 
allied with special ed, which again is pretty knowledgeable to know, as Representative Cabral noted, the others was going to be a commission to study. So dealing with the real costs, I think everybody agrees with, and that's going to vary from district to district, town to town, city to city. But where I come in, which I don't think the study has dealt with, is sometimes in bumping that cost up and making the cost real, it could result in suburban districts paying much more. Now that $1 billion, for instance, just to put it in context, and this is not how it would be done at all, but if you took the 351 communities, that's, I'd come up with about $2.8 million per community, new money, if it was spread evenly across the district. One, not how it's going to be done, but I like to get things in context. So you're talking almost $3 million per district is what a $1 billion into the system would do if it was spread evenly. Not going to happen that way, but just the knowledge. So I'm coming in new and also saying, well, I agree. Let's look at the real cost to educate, but let's also look at the real revenue. Because the next step in the formula is once you've identified the foundation budget, how much it does cost to educate, and all these things are appropriate um, with the English the second language and you know economically disadvantaged students. Let's look at the real cost of the real revenue. Because the next step in the formula is assessing wealth of the community to see how much they should pay, and then the state picks up the rest. So what I've seen in my time in town government, um, and I spoke several times at some of the listening sessions that they did a few years ago for this report, is <clears throat> the formula looks at two things. It looks at income, okay, that we can get the data on. But then it looks at the um, appraised value of property. And the difference that I'd like to look at as, as another way to mitigate potentially what can happen in the suburbs is there's the appraised value and then there's an assessed value. In some of our communities we have, for instance, chapter lands for agriculture. The appraised value is what it would be developed, but the actual amount of money that the community can bring in tax-wise is much less or if it's state-owned lands. I worked at DCR statewide uh, prior to doing this job. There are some communities out west where two-thirds, three-quarters of the land mass is state-owned land. There's no taxes. And we need to make sure the formulas don't hurt those communities as well that look at what the appraised value of all that land is and say, well, you're a rich community. But there's no way that that community could ever realize. Transfer of wealth. I don't think that's what uh, we're con contemplating in this. I think the, 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 the question is new money. Where will new money go? Well, Please, I don't think anybody contemplates taking anything away from any community. That would be uh, dead on arrival. That's what your colleague said on Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. 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 On Tuesday said yeah. that everybody has to get something. Yes. Right. Well, we're we're talking sense. about, about yeah. new money. Now, re uh, redistribution. Yeah. Right. Well, and, if, yeah. and if I could just, just step away from that topic for a second and just you know, talk, I think a lot of um, concern out there and, and advocacy elevating on we need to do this, right? We need to change the formula. I think there's no one at this table as we sit here today. We're in our districts every day. We see this dire changes in what's going on in the classrooms and in our schools today. Uh, representing primarily Fall River with it, with a precinct in Freetown, the schools have changed dramatically of the needs. You know, our, our, the social emotional needs in our classrooms are huge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just picking up on when Rep. Schmidt said that, I mean, we're not, we know where the gaps are. The gaps are not necessarily everywhere. We know where they are. And they're in the communities like the Fall River, New Bedford, the Gateway communities and others, and, uh, and they're real. Uh, once we ended session last year, um, I had uh, Chair Peich uh, come down to Fall River um, to uh, because you know there was concern, right? You, know, you only get certain information. What happened? The deal broke down, you know, and we knew we were going to gear up for the session. So we had Chair Peich come down this summer, and, and Rep. Schmidt and I were there, and uh, with all the uh, educators, leaders, and classroom teachers, as well as. Um, you know, special uh, uh, adjustment counselors and others, and they were giving us 
the day you teach stories of what they deal with in the classroom, let alone the larger class sizes. But um, one teacher needed to spend uh, a bit adjustment counselor spent her whole day, and, and this is in a few hundred children in the in the school, eight hundred. She spent the day chasing a child on a wall after recess to for safety to recall Rev Schmidt, um, and, and that took her. Uh, away from a parent meeting on a very, very serious subject that parents had come in for. And, and these are not simple um, behavioral issues that we grew up with in our classroom. The reality is, no, I mean, Rep. Paul is right. We have to look at not you know, harming anyone, and, and that's not the intention. We gotta figure out how to get the funds because we're being screamed at, and I say that in a loving way, for a billion and a half dollars a year extra. And That's the challenge. Not to also, there's a role for local communities to, to, better, to do several things better. Uh, places like New Bedford that have improved uh, is identifying ELL students, right? And also, a better, we need a better definition and a better, uh, how to better identify low income. If you notice since we had free lunches, in New Bedford and other communities, um, everybody gets free lunch regardless of income. So that in itself has created an issue of who is low income, who's not low income. So we gotta get a better, better sense of that and that's the role of the local community, local school department to do that. I mean, New Bedford, along with many other communities in the state, lost over since 2002, millions of dollars just on ELL students. By the way, the existing formula does account for some ELL additional costs, except we start counting them. If you remember, because of the referendum, we start counting those students. In the Bedford, they very recently, didn't have a good number either. It was now like to 100 people. Now it's not, uh, I think it's over 3,000 now they have identified. So they need to do also a better count of those students. We, can, we no longer can start counting like we did. Uh, so there are some roles uh, for local communities to play here. We had lots of discussion at the State House about how really uh, out of date our tax code is, and, and uh, it is based on a manufacturing economy where we tend to tax things uh, that are made, if you will, uh, and of course it's changed. And there's a concern that we aren't taxing things. A really great example uh, was. Uh, Amazon type sales, uh, uh, which until just recently weren't getting taxed, uh, really to the detriment of Main Street retailers. But so, and that was just one example uh, of, of things that weren't getting taxed. And then some of the credits that are being given out, like famously the film tax credit. There's, a, you know, there's a lot of people arguing on both sides of that. But for those, in those two pots, the thought is. Uh, that maybe with some thoughtful reform, uh, as, as Tony's just said, that there would be some increased uh, revenue. Here's, uh, here's, here's the growth in revenue for the state, and we'll see this fiscal year, we don't know what's going to be next fiscal year, or the, I'm saying fiscal year 2020 that is being projected. Um, right now, there's a consensus revenue growth, right, between it administration and the House and Senate that they already put out, which is at 2.7, right? Even though this economy is supposed to be humming, right? And uh, we have unemployment at the lowest levels in almost 50 years in the country and in the state as well. Now in some, you know, some pockets uh, bigger than that. But a growth of 2.7 is a problem, right? How are we gonna fit in, even if it's a phase in, Let's say, let's say if we, we get all four recommendations, we, we're gonna act on those four recommendations. And let's, for the sake of discussion, let's say it's a billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say it's five year phase in. And we can do the math, right? How are we gonna get that additional money on top of the growth of chapter 70 anyway? It's been growing around 3% or so, depending on what the government recommends. Uh, mm -hmm. This fiscal year they are, they, that we are in now, the growth is 3.9, right? Prediction. And we are lowering for the next fiscal year at 2.7. And the projections were not Actually, tremendously positive for the future. 
And yeah, that, that, but but we were under projected on this on the other fiscal year because we came up with a surplus of over six hundred million dollars. Uh, the fiscal year was just ended July thirty. Uh, thirty, I mean June thirtieth. Uh, so I think the projections of growth are, are they either off or very conservative, or there's a concern going forward of the recession is down the road. Right and again, uh, we don't know what that is. So yeah, we can look at that. Uh, as uh, some of the other colleagues talked about, with some tax incentives, some operations with film tax, and all that, but that will not get you to a billion dollars. Uh, what I'm saying is we need to carefully look at our revenue sources, what the growth will be, how we, uh, is, is the experts or the economists that come in, along with the administration, JNF, JNF has a lot to do with how to project those things, right? Um, and we know who sits in JNF, right? Um, on the administration, uh, so they have a tendency to project things a little more, uh, you know, conservatively in that sense. So we have to really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned with the growth of 2.7. We can't even, 2.7, we, we have to build the next budget. We're going to debate it in the House most likely in April, sometimes in April. Uh, and this is this an obstacle you're not going to get over? Or are you suggesting that something may not get passed in the legislative session? No, I think something's going to get passed. Okay. No, that's my hope, and that's what I believe. The momentum is there, and we cannot lose the this amount momentum. The may not be. We might have to uh, look at uh, different ways of how, how should the phasing be five years, should the phasing be seven years. I mean, we've got to look at different options here. So that's so sure. It's a, I'm like I'm not sure it's a mess. Okay. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to just make the point that I think we should be tremendously uh, encouraged by the fact that we are as far along on this discussion as we are. Because we're talking fundamentally about how we allocate money. And that, that is a thicket. Uh, and, and yet we're talking about it. And I just want to give kudos uh, to people like Tony, who have been on the forefront of this battle for a long time, and a, a big shout out to our colleague, uh, uh, Chair uh, Representative Peich, the Chair of the Education Committee. Uh, for the past four years, there's been a commission that has been studying the foundation uh, budget, and it's been their recommendations uh, that we have to increase our funding in ELL offset for health care. We actually have passed some of those recommendations, yeah, right? Yeah. The House yeah. passed Thank two. you, Tom. Yes. Uh, and, and at the same time, we included another commission to come back in six months uh, for the other two recommendations. And the Senate actually passed all four already, once. So, so, so we're... That's, right, but you haven't solved the revenue problem yet. Well, that's, the vote that's, that's the next action. step. At least, <laughs> at least we've decided that what is currently allocated needs improvement for cities like New Bedford and Fall River. And we've identified the areas. And, and I was starting to give a big shout out uh, to Chair Peich, who comes from Wellesley. You know, <laughs> we don't have to worry about Wellesley. She has taken it upon herself to spend a lot of time down in down here in New Bedford and Fall River. As uh, Rep. Viola mentioned, she spent an afternoon with us uh, this summer. Uh, she's been here uh, in New Bedford sitting with the superintendent. She was with uh, the superintendent in Fall River a couple of years ago. And, and she's really taken it upon herself to uh, understand the issues down here. and. and we, we are moving. Uh, this conversation yeah. will continually come we back today. But, but so today, this conversation will continually come back to where's the money? Yeah. Right? right? So it was nice, and, and, and again, it was pitched out, and the Senate put it out there. We're doing it all, but there was no number attached. So, and we put a little bit, you know, we did health care, we're phasing it in. The Adobe Ed reform back in what, 25 years ago, this year, I believe, um, was phased in. 
over seven years, right. I understand. Yeah. So um, I was back in school at the time and, and, right. and wasn't it seven years. But, but, seven, but seven years. So we know these issues are dramatic. Right. They've been surfacing the commission, and, and yes, it's not fast enough for anyone. But it would be fair to say that it's been many years that they've been talking about every form of passing happens yet. And I think that most of the I think it's, it's certainly coming to a head now. 2015. That's right. We have three years. Yeah, yeah, it's obviously in some respect going to be a compromise. You know, where's the new revenue going to come from? How much of it? I think every, the thing we all agree on from a, a, across the, the Commonwealth is that we need to make whatever revenue we get a priority for education, period. Um, so when I see, you know, I was at a press conference with Tony yesterday. Um, with Ch Senator Chang Diaz, who is, you know, who is pushing the, uh, the, the promise bill, uh, which, which, as you said, encompasses a whole uh, number of things. Um, but, but those issues are at least identified, and, and I think um, getting the hard numbers on that, you know, uh, associating that with the new revenue, you know, how are we going to get health care costs down? Health care is a major um, obstacle of, of, the, of, uh, of education because right. that, it's constantly rising. A lot of that, the, the Chapter 70 funding goes to that. So when you say make a priority for education, does that mean transportation and health care, which is not going to receive the money from the federal government that it did in previous years, are a lower priority? If, if, if you're asking me what's more important, education or transportation, I would say education, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm new to this, I'm new to the game, you know, I, there's a lot of things to learn. Um, about uh, making new laws, especially something as comprehensive as this. But when you have, um, you know, the health care issue, you know, identified, you have, we know what's wrong with the old law uh, with respect to the people with disabilities uh, or children with disabilities. It's a very speculative, that the law 25 years ago was very speculative as, as to how many children are going to be using or needing uh, SPED services in schools. Um, so the new law, you know, um, put forth by the Senate with Senator Chang Diaz identifies that and says, let's let's do it based on cold hard facts instead of speculation. I think things like that, common sense uh, approaches, um, are going to do do well for, for the, the children and of the Commonwealth. And, workforce. and so the, it, it starts to become a cyclical issue where, well, if we if we don't fund the education, then we may see declining. Uh, growth because we're not providing those workers, and that runs full range not only in the educated, you know, um, secondary education and so on for white collar jobs, but it goes right down to manufacturing jobs. I know I've talked to manufacturers, a few that are left in, the, in my um, district, and they can't find those skilled vocational workers. So that was where you mentioned before vocational up and down the, the line. Educated workforce will help us grow our economy. So. There is, that's where the give and take does come, and I think that's why I'm encouraged, because we're not just talking about throwing money at something, we're looking at putting money in debt, in, truly, as an investment, that's an overused term, but. Of the difference between <laughs> cities and yes. <laughs> different right. needs. Right. You know, Back to the concern, yeah. Greater so, needs. Uh, so, greater I mean, needs. So, okay, so you, 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 a fair. Well, yeah, I do. I, I, I swear, I haven't heard, you know, we talk about new money. I, I, I think the concern, and it hits on what you asked me, is the concern is when you come out to, to our districts where where it's becoming the foundation budget will become a mandated that's what you will spend on your students right. you, you, the reason I ask you want to be holding you you, you you know that the property tax is the last place to go and, and, and if no if no other money comes from another source that's where it's going to come from. you say you know we, we're not quick enough 2015 the commission recommendations but there was a there was a thrown out there the ballot initiative on uh, what has been called the millionaire tax that was you know in, in, in between 2015 and now that was looked at as a tool to help with revenue so so there it's not like nothing had been done there were uh, tools and, and and you know put out there and uh, again it's not easy finding a billion dollars a year uh, but that was one of them and that didn't work and so we came back to uh, as we continued looking at other sources but that really threw threw something out the window that was going to be looked at as education, transportation, and, and possibly yeah. would have happened. You know, a family in Boston has a vested interest in a well-educated populace down in New Bedford. And that goes the same with, with the Cape relative to Worcester and, and all other areas of the state. So, so when it comes to education, 
you know, when I say prioritizing education, that you know, if, if there are some areas that receive less resources for whatever reason, then so be it. But at the end of the day, the end game should be a, a better educated youth here uh, in the Commonwealth. And if that comes at the expense of, of some towns getting receiving less money because they already have those resources, then so be it. But I would put the teachers in Wellesley and the teachers in Fall River and in Bedford and Freetown and everywhere else in our in our area here on equal plane. But what's going on in the classroom? And the challenges in Wellesley are night and day from the challenges in the Fall River and the Bedford in terms of, so when you say that people are gonna be saying they need more money too, well this is what, you know, why we're here and this is, you know, why these recommendations, those recommendations clearly outline certainly health care for everyone and all that, but we have got some different extenuating yeah. circumstances. There are some blue superintendents for on Tuesday night and I think having multiple superintendents representing multiple districts talking about very passionately the number of cuts they've had to make, the, the struggle that they're having to make. Yeah, I don't know if that influenced anyone. No, it's it, it, that it. goes to the piece that we talked about earlier. How about you know a collective, pretty much consensus statewide on on, on needing to fix this issue. And I was very encouraged uh, by that to see, uh, like you said, all those superintendents, uh, you know, the people who were in the room, the people who showed up. It, it, it's, it, it's a building. Um, uh, consensus on this issue, but it, it, it's not very difficult. Chris, um, uh, we're talking to you, we're looking over our way, because you haven't been doing enough, and that is... But uh, regardless if you have it. or not, the pressure is on you guys, don't you think that it's, well, listen, it's, there's just, a demand no, to get I think we need done. that pressure yeah. from the outside. Yeah, we do. It's any important. major piece of legislation, or any major shift on sh on any, kinds of, any kind of formula, like you know, shut this out, needs outside momentum needs outside pressure, mm -hmm. both from editorial boards down to superintendents, teachers, unions. Uh, we need that kind of thing. Right. It only happens, it won't happen just from the pressure inside the building amongst sure. each other, right? Or criminal and justice so, reform. That did so not we, just we one that. day wake up. We need up. that. I don't, and I'm not afraid of that pressure. I think we need that. I think it's important. That will create additional momentum for us to get it done. And I think we'll, we'll get it done. Now, will every district see the same increase as the better will absolutely not and they shouldn't right uh, but some all this was we'll see some adjustment in particular on on the health care cost mm -hmm. uh, be lakeville mm -hmm. or be wellesley or whoever it might be and i'm not here to defend wellesley they do all right in this world um, and quite frankly the state is really the number one in this country in terms of education we are number one in the country in terms of education number one of the sat uh, results with them. I would like to pick up on that and also something Norman began. Approach is linked to the receivership of the school system. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what the formula should address is that achievement gap and how do we yeah. fix that? We've been talking about it for so, many, so long. This is the time okay. to do it. Uh, and when I talk about accountability, it's not just, depend, you know, I'm not a huge fan of high stakes test myself, or, you know, and we don't want to take away from educating just to get. But when I talk about economy, it's really, you know, we don't want to see that, um, you know, additional money goes, let's say it goes to like three times like, and, 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 and the superintendent says, well, you know what, we, we've got these other things covered. Let's build a new, you know, siphon some money off for some capital project. Or whatever. I mean, we just want to make sure that if it is for these issues that we've identified, healthcare, special ed, you know, economically disadvantaged, et cetera, that it's going towards that. So you're you're right. Right. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's 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 not personally when I talk about accountability. I just want to make sure it's going to those okay. things and it's addressing those things. I mean, so realistically, that might free up other sections of the budget that right now are covering the shortfalls. Realistically, we could. Right. Number twenty. Uh, I think that's a great beginning. That's where the money should go. Is strictly into the classroom. Um, and I, I and as you said, I think. Uh, those additional resources will come to school districts like ours in the Bedford. It will really, it will sort of help the other areas of the budget because we don't have to put in so much for other things. Uh, the capital piece, I mean, there is a, uh, there is a, the best, the best school capital improvement program in the country. Is yeah. we have in Massachusetts yeah. the School Building Authority, and that's where all those things should be yeah, channeled sure. through. Uh, not sure. like what we did, by the way, several years back. We had an exception done. That I passed it in the House and the Senate, and it was passed by Senator McTigney when the numbers, when they couldn't count in the Bedford. Uh, so we got an additional few million dollars that came to the city because of that. We corrected that. 
Never before Chapter 7 had been corrected that way. We were corrected for that fiscal year for the Bedford. Some of that money went to fix the issue of the fire that Carnegie Academy and other capital projects, that's not acceptable. And that's what I want to happen when it comes to additional funding. Comes okay, to but, uh, but I think it's important to allow teachers also to teach. It's important for kids to get other experiences in addition just to standardized testing, such as music, such as sports, such as art. I mean, that an all-rounded education. Uh, so they collided, and these teachers are, are, are in the classroom when you get dealing with the high stakes, test, stakes testing with the English language learners, with the social emotional behaviors in the classroom, and they're trying to manage high numbers in the classroom, and they are trying to manage this. So there's been an outpouring of saying, we're, we're, we're strangling. These educators visit the classrooms, Jack. These, these teachers, you know, are magicians. First grade teachers are 28 kids in the classroom. Several on medication, several with, you know, uh, it's 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 a it's a concern for them. So now add to that as that was growing, all those issues, the high stakes testing, and you got to prepare, and you got to plan, and their tenure and their um, performance is evaluated on that, and 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 so, gosh, I mean, not to go back at all, but I think when we grew up, every one of us with uh, SRAs and and all these things, I mean. We did it, and we walked to school, we walked home, we came back, it was a little, it was a different day. And so, surely the Pioneer Institute wants to ensure that we have standards. We're number one in the country, and the only problem is, we're not number one, and this is what the educators would say, the superintendents the other day, in many of the schools. But let's give yeah. our teachers in the classroom the tools they needed, that they need to be able to bring every kid up to that high standard, no matter where they live, no matter what the zip code is. Yeah. I think first we need to, the state needs to fully fund it at 100%. This this fiscal year, we only funded at 50 to, 52%, correct? Right? Uh, so the city of Rebecca, for example, if it was if we had funded that line item at 100%, the city of Rebecca would have received a reimbursement of almost 4 million rather than 1.8 million or 1.9 million, right? So that, that does mean something, right, for places like the Bedford. Uh, not so much for places, uh, wealthy communities, because they don't have charter schools. And the reason why we have charter schools is because, because of the achievement gap as well, right? Under that cap, the, new, and the reason why New Bedford and all these seats are available is because we are still under the cap of that. Uh, so it, in essence, it sort of penalizes, I think, to a certain degree, communities like New Bedford and Fall River and Holyoke, Brockton, Lawrence, the list goes on, right? So we need to, I think, step one, we need to fully fully fund that line item to begin with. Second, we need to look how many years of reimbursement should we have. Should it be uh, just 100% on the first year? Should it be greater than, should it be then drop to 25% on the second, third, and fourth year? So we gotta look at that. Ideally, in the long run, in my opinion, and I've always been of that opinion, that that should be a complete separate line item. Should not be, be coming from chapter 70, should not be coming from the foundation money. That's that needs momentum as well. That needs a tremendous uh, uh, support from the outside. Would that better funding of it or worse? Well, we, at least with, with uh, uh, first would stop Robin Peter to pay Paul. We would have a line item that pays Paul and another line item that pays Peter, right? And then, uh, uh, yes, the, the, the charter school community, meaning, you know, the administrators and the board of directors and all that stuff, they would have to step up their game and try to convince the legislature that they deserve additional funding. ...to be discussed, but uh, I don't see it as necessarily as part of part of the bill that would uh, get the full recommendations of the, of the foundation necessarily be part of that. If we can include in that, if we can somehow amend that, that would be great. Is uh, it a priority? It is a priority for me, and it is a priority for many other folks. Is it a priority for the majority? We don't know. So, yeah. Get the money in, does it have to be done by the formula? Well, can you address the four issues and get the money faster? Well, we, I am committed to all four, but I think what's, uh, what's fair at least to, to say is that, and I know the Senate does things sometimes uh, more progressively, and, and that's great for them, you know. Uh, but I'm saying is at least what we did in the House in the last session, not only we, we did adopt all four at once, but we, we put money on the two that we adopted, okay. we put $500 million 
over a five-year period. The Senate did base you didn't identify a revenue. No, we did not. I mean, but that means a hundred million every year, depending on the growth, depending on the growth of the economy and the growth of the revenue. A hundred million can be somewhat worked into the to, into, into that, right? Yeah. So you have some new streams right. coming on, small ones. You have small streams like uh, marijuana, gambling. Uh, so will be additional streams of, of, of that. So the question is, should and, and I think it's fair to say that the other two items, ELL and low income, it's already part of the formula, Christy. It's already part of the formula. The communities do a good job at that. They're going to see already a difference on their foundation money, on their chapter seventy money. We need to make adjustments in those two, absolutely. And I want to get them done as soon as possible. And I think that the approach that we did is six months later, we're going to have the commission come back and say, by the way, because the, uh, the commission, the review commission, did not put numbers to those two paragraphs, per se, right? So we need to have some good numbers around those two paragraphs. I mean, who, I don't think there's anybody that cares more about ELL uh, issues than I, than I care about, right? So that's important to me. Can you study how much the numbers should be? Well, I mean, if that's what we did the last time. Right? That's some expertise. It was what we wanted, it didn't. Put some people in a room that really know how to look at these things uh, and, and come back and say, okay, you need to, uh, uh, it's going to cost you for your know, students in, in low income an additional uh, 500 million for us. Right. They project, they're projecting that, but they're not sure what it is. Uh, in order for us to address those, and we need to address them, the sooner the better. I would, I said, I would say five years would be ideal. Perhaps we have to look at seven years, they said, like we did when we did Five or seven year phase in. Right, like we did the last time we did the other reform in 93. It was a seven year phase in, and then build upon those, once upon growth to accommodate that additional 100 million or additional 400 million uh, that goes to education. We have a rainy day fund that is over 2 billion already now, okay? And uh, should we continue to put some money around that rainy day fund? Absolutely. We have to build it up to about at least I would say 2.8 billion would be a comfortable number because uh, this way would not would have a nice a nice cushion today in case of what kind of recession might come down the line. Because then we have to put in. We want to say is exactly where the money's going to come and exactly how much money we're going to put in. I think what we have come to this table, whether it's norm, it's a bipartisan. United from the executive office, the governor, lieutenant governor, the Senate, the House, we all have said this is a priority. Yeah. And so we are now beginning uh, to come, we've, we've just come back. Uh, we're now hearing more from the advocates, which, as I think what uh, Tony said, is so true. And, and, and Paul and I were talking about this the other night when we were there, uh, Chris. This is important. This is the momentum that is, that is needed for us to, as we're going to work, looking at all these things, Tony mentioned, every little pocket and every stream of money and what the projections are. We just heard revenue consensus at 2.7%. Now the governor's budget's gonna come out. We're starting this work. Our sleeves are just now rolled up and we hear them loud and clear. And they gotta stay loud so that we can continue to, to push along. But this is a priority. I think everyone said it, and um, but we can't give the answers to exactly how much. To there's no transparency in that. So you need accountability in terms of spending. Accountability, but transparency. I want to know how much. I mean, how much is I lose 145 million dollars going to actually the classroom? Well, can you build that into the law by by by? by well, by chapter seven is written because, because if you have to take into consideration, like let's say, let's look at the health care. Right? Health care. The city provides health care and then charges back to the school. You look at, at least that's the way it's done in most cities, right? It is done in the case of it's been, it's been years that actually the city has not spent what they charge the school about. Then they give it back to the school department for bills. That's the kind of transparency we need to see. It's been years since the city. It's been, no, it's been some years, right? That actually the city has not spent as much as they have charged originally charged really? the school about. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Uh, well, I don't know how many times, I don't know the amount of uh, in those times. That's the kind of transparency. I mean, I, yeah. I'm fighting for my constituents. It's important that we all have transparency on the table. We already took many, many, many moons ago, right? The state said, we'll take care of the pension system for the people.
teachers. That's a, uh, an expense that was taken away from the local community. Maybe is Healthgate probably could be on the table on that? Is that a discussion? Nobody's discussing that. Uh, maybe instead of giving you more money for healthcare, maybe there's another way of addressing the healthcare issue. Yeah, the state plan is not it's on the state plan. I mean, the GIC plan, I think, is probably the plan we have. Uh, that's, okay. the right, that's the plan we have. That's a great plan. plan. That's a great plan. I'm, 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 saying, the I'm saying there's, a great plan. these are all, I'm not saying that I'm in favor of this versus that, but this, I'm talking, this is what I'm talking about, transparency. I mean, I want to know where my dollars are going. Those are all, and I think every citizen in the Bedford, uh, or every resident, I should use the term resident, um, or any other city would like to know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> transparency and accountability is important for everybody. It's important. It, it, it's what the constituents need to see in order to feel comfortable with the spending that goes on. And any budget in any municipality, the, the far and the vast majority is, is the school. So I think they do deserve as much accountability, as much transparency as an appropriate word to use towards where that money is going. But Jeff, I have this conversation, do you have concerns for Westport? Do you see any danger for them in this conversation? Well, I would never let uh, Westport receive one dollar less right. than it is currently getting. Okay, so you're not concerned? Uh, I want to see, uh, I want to see uh, unrestricted local aid and Chapter 70 money increased uh, for Westport. Okay. But I have a sense of priorities. Okay, okay. Good. We really appreciate, we, speaking as a Gateway City uh, legislator, we really appreciate the support that we've gotten throughout this process uh, from our colleagues who represent suburban uh, towns. And we'll never forget that. Thank you all for coming yeah. in. This has been great. I hope we can do it on other issues. I, I would love to. And, and um, it's yeah. been very and helpful. Thank you for Tony for uh, yeah. 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 being so knowledgeable. You know, issues. one thing, Jack, you have to say from last week to Tuesday to today, um, we do have one of the best legislative groups. I mean, I, I'm not blowing smoke at you. I mean, we like each other. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. Okay. Can, can so the Citizen Advisory is not speaking for the entire. No. <laughs>